The Volvo 300 series was a common sight on British roads in the 1980s due to its popularity amongst practical people to buy a safe, affordable car. But many of these slow-driving, flat-cap drivers weren't aware that this car didn't start out life as a Volvo at all, and rather than being Swedish-built, it was built in the Netherlands. They also probably weren't aware that this pedestrian car would go on to win in Rallycross. So just where did this car come from? This is the Volvo 300 story. DAF, short for Van Dorn's Anhag Wagen Fabrik, or Van Dorn's Trailer Factory, started life in the Netherlands in 1928 as the Van Dorn Brothers Vehicle Repair Shop. They soon started conversion of trucks into the sort of things that the Dutch military could use, but their efforts came too late for the war effort as the German forces steamrolled through the Netherlands in 1940. After the devastation of the war, buying new trucks was difficult. The US Marshall Plan provided a series of aid and loan to countries that wanted it to rebuild after the war, and the Netherlands ended up with today's equivalent of around £8.4 billion. Rebuilding required construction vehicles, and DAF saw an opportunity to build trucks, trailers and buses. The Dutch military also needed rebuilding, and DAF was more than happy to supply military versions of their trucks. The Van Dorn brothers had designed their first car during the war, the one-off Regenjas or raincoat that looked a little bit like a clown car, and was sold onto a circus, presumably for that express purpose. It would take until 1959 until they would launch their first mass production car, the DAF 600. It used an innovative variomatic continuously variable transmission, or CVT, the first one to be commercially successful. It used a V-shaped belt drive that ran between two cone-shaped pulleys. By altering the size of the cones on each shaft, the speed of each shaft could be varied. This of course meant that the car could drive as fast backwards as forwards, which meant that at the Dutch annual backwards driving championships, yes, there was such a thing, DAF cars had to be put in a special category of their own. A range of small DAFs appeared in the 60s, but they soon started designing a mid-size car as the P200, 300, 400 and 500. They'd employed designer Giovanni Michelotti, who'd proposed several shapes. The project ultimately didn't go anywhere, but Michelotti would recycle some of the shapes as proposals for the Triumph 1300, designed around the same time. Michelotti would be called upon by DAF to style many of their small cars into the late 1960s. Another attempt at creating a mid-sized car began in 1970 with the P900 project. This time, all shapes were considered – saloon, estate, hatchback and even a coupe. Tenders were put out to two outside designers, Michelotti and Batoni, plus two internal designs. All four designs were then put up to the staff to vote on, with one of the internal designs winning out. It was also the most aerodynamic shape, so this hatchback design was chosen for the new car, tentatively called the DAF 77. Bringing a car to market costs money, more money than DAF had at the time, so the company reached out to other car companies to partner with. Audi were initially keen, but this was close to the Audi 50 that would launch in 1974. Chrysler and Volvo were also interested, but it was BMW that showed the most interest. They were keen on DAF's spare production capacity and wanted to start BMW 2002 production there, but they also looked at P900 production, going as far as to work out which BMW engines and transmissions would best fit into the chassis. In the end, both sides called it off. BMW couldn't produce an engine that would work in the engine bay, and DAF's board weren't keen on working with BMW. Volvo had passed on the project because bringing the car to market was just too pricey. However, a development in the P900 project would change all that. Renault supplied the engines for the DAF 55 and 66, and were persuaded to continue supplying a larger 1.4-litre version for the new car, reducing the cost of having to design a new engine in-house. With DAF's board keen to work with Volvo, the deal was done. Initially, Volvo would take a one-third stake in DAF's car division, but this would rise to a three-quarters controlling stake two years later in 1975. 
Some models continued to be produced for a few more years, with the DAF 66 being restyled and improved as the Volvo 66. But Volvo had their eyes on the P900. They were only producing large cars, well, large car, as the 200 series, other than the Volvo 66, was their entire range by the mid-1970s. The DAF purchase allowed them to move into the mid-size car market. Another benefit of the DAF purchase was the extra production capacity and the fact that it was located in the Netherlands, a founding member of the common market that would allow Swedish Volvo, outside of this trading block, easier access to sell into EEC countries. Work continued on bringing the P900 to market, but DAF had doubts and were second-guessing themselves. Should it be bigger or smaller? Was the styling right? They hired another stylist to come up with new ideas, but it was left to Jan Vilsgaard, Volvo's chief designer, to decide the final direction. He wasn't entirely happy with the original P900 design, or the new styling changes, but as the project was getting close to release, he had little choice in what he could do. In the end, he went with the original design, with a few small styling choices, plus bigger Volvo safety bumpers. In fact, Volvo had ensured it had a pretty good list of safety features, such as a collapsible steering column, a padded dashboard, split circuit brakes, crumple zones and a safety cell. The Volvo 343 was launched in 1976. The design wasn't a hit with the press to start off with. That notchback tail seemed a little odd, but the style would grow on people and would be adopted for cars such as the Ford Escort. The 1.4 litre Renault engine was married to DAF's CVT gearbox. No manual gearbox was initially available. The press found it unrefined, certainly compared to regular automatic gearboxes. It felt like the clutch was continually slipping and it made the car underpowered. In fact, there were a laundry list of problems. The car was noisy, especially with that CVT gearbox. It leaked, the heating system wasn't up to much, the dashboard and seat had issues and the rear seat was too high. The last problem was because the fuel tank and gearbox were mounted underneath the rear seats. The marketing men tried to pitch this as a benefit. It provided better weight distribution, which was true, but calling it Porsche-like was a bit of a stretch. Over the next three years, Volvo listened to feedback, and most of these issues were addressed, making the 343 a much better car to own. It was the right way to go, as prioritising fixing problems is better than adding more flashy new features. It's an approach companies today could take note of. I'm looking at you, Microsoft, with glaring windows and office bugs that have been present for years. An enterprising Volvo rally driver, Carl Magnus Skoka, tricked out a 343 with a 2-litre VW engine to attempt a world record, the fastest diesel car. It looks like the engine compartment got bigger to fit the engine, and the car was lightened with a glass fibre body. With the help of a turbo, the car was able to get to 144 miles an hour, and in the official test, the record was broken with a 131 mile an hour run. Volvo would investigate a new shape for the 343 with the Tundra concept. As I mentioned in the Citroën BX story, this was a Bertone design that had originally been designed for Reliant, then reworked to fit over the Volvo 343 chassis. It wasn't of Volvo's tastes and they passed on it, although they would attempt to produce a coupe with the 1986 Volvo 480. The main reason behind this decision could well have been the money worries. With the mid-70s downturn in the car market, and particularly for large cars, Volvo had picked exactly the wrong time to spend money buying DAF. This had led it to fighting for survival for much of the latter half of the 70s. The 343 got two extra doors in 1979 as the 345, with the last number denoting the number of doors. Both cars got the option of a manual gearbox, grafted from the Volvo 240. Another part taken from the 240 was its 2-litre engine. That tight engine bay didn't offer much space, but once the spare tyre had been relocated to the boot, Volvo managed to shoehorn it in. The larger engine was offered in DLS and GLS trim models from 1981 and gave the car more oomph, but not heart-stoppingly so. The 0-60 time still failed to crack 10 seconds. 
Volvo made the 1.4 litre engine more sporty by boring it out to 1.6 litres as the 343 Ottinger, but despite the go faster stripes, performance wasn't that hot. This wasn't the first time Volvo had tried making the 343 go faster. In 1977, they designed the 343 CS concept. It used the V6 Peugeot Renault Volvo engine found in the 260 and looked like the car could be used for Sweden's remake of Starskin Hutch, a TV show I definitely pay to watch. Probably the fastest production 343 was the R Sport model in 1981 that tuned the larger 2 litre engine to a reputed 122 horsepower, finally getting the 0 60 time below 10 seconds. These sporty models coincided with Volvo taking the car rallying, and it won the 1980 European Championship of Rallycross. Britain had warmed to this pint sized Volvo. By 1982, it was the eighth best selling car and would remain in the top 10 for another two years. Sensible people who wanted a safe car but didn't want to pay extra for a 200 series or didn't have a garage large enough found this was just the right car for them. Back in the Netherlands, Volvo produced a van variant by filling in the rear windows and removing the rear seats. This was initially produced for the Dutch Postal Service, but was available to anyone who put down good money for one. Also in 1982, both the 343 and 345 got a small update with updated front bumpers and lights, and the following year the range was renamed in line with the 240 and 260 models, with the 340 getting the 1.4 litre engine and the 360 the now fuel injected 2 litre engine. Volvo had investigated making estate and cabriolet versions, but settled on just releasing a four-door saloon. It was particularly well received in the UK, as saloons continued to do well there. The 200 series had gone over and above most other cars for safety, and Volvo realised it could carve out a niche as the purveyors of safer cars. The 340 and 360 gained headlight wipers and side impact protection, and they played up its safety cell and crumple zones. Rather than focusing on the additional performance of the 360, adverts talked of its endurance, and it was entered into the 24-hour event at Surfers Paradise in Australia. But it was likely the excellent price that attracted many people, as the base model was cheaper than the Austin Maestro or Ford Escort. The list of engines increased in 1985, with an enlarged 1.7 litre version of the 1.4 litre Renault engine, and a 1.6 litre diesel option. Volvo sold the car in Australia and some parts of Asia, and assembly began in Malaysia to serve those markets. But with Volvo's focus now firmly on the replacement to the 300 series, the larger 400 series that would arrive as a coupe in 1986 and a full range in 1988, updates to the 300 series were now few and far between. Volvo celebrated 1 million cars sold in 1988, and the UK got a millionaire special edition with electric windows, leather seats and air conditioning. Volvo had a habit of continuing to sell the older model as a budget option, even though the new model had superseded it. They'd done it with the 200 series that ended up outlasting the car it was supposed to replace. They attempted to do the same with the 300 series by selling it next to the 400 series, but with more customers buying the 400 series, 360 production ended in 1988 and 340 production ended in 1991. Volvo might have felt they'd bitten off more than they could chew in 1973 when they purchased DAF just as the car market collapsed, but the 300 series ended up being a strong seller. It didn't sell in the quantities of the 200 or 700 series, but a decade of safety conscious practical motorists got Volvo out of money difficulties and back onto firm financial ground. This is the Volvo 300 series story. That just sounds awful. Rebuilding required construction vehicles and DAF saw an opportunity to build bots, bucks, rucks and… yeah. The Van Dorn brothers had designed their first car during the war, the one-off Regenjas. The Van Dorn brothers had designed their first car during the war, the one-off Regenjas or raincoat that looked a little like a clown car, and I've forgotten my keyboard. Bringing a car, ringing, 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 ringing,
what was that crazy frog thing? An enterprising Volvo rally driver, Carl Madness. Madness. Carl Madness Skoka tripped over a 343. Volvo. 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 Back in the Netherlands, Volvo produced. Man, that sounded a bit angry. Ah! Volvo celebrated 1 million cars sold in 1988, and the UK got a millionaire special edition with electric seats, leather seats, electric seats, electric leather seats, and air conditioned electric leather seats. 